Finally, after much ado, I can announce the Scandalogy panel that we have this morning, or I should say the Scandalogy roundtable, because just like we have the Research Lab for Character Assassination and Reputation Politics, we have the Liberalism Studies Program, we also have a very interesting initiative in uh, Germany, namely the Scandalogy Network, and CARP has been collaborating with them for several years now, and we've also been attending each other's conferences and exchanging ideas. So it's my honor to introduce to you uh, André Haller, Hendrik Michael, and Mariana Grebreza. And perhaps I'll ask each of you to shortly introduce yourself to the audience. Mariana, please start. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, my name is Mariana Grebesha. I'm teaching at the Faculty of Political Sciences in at the University of Zagreb, and um, I have uh, we have started collaborating collaborating with this wonderful initiative of Scandalogy last year, basically mostly contributing with our celebrity populism initiative and the research on on populists and how they engage with uh, scandals and mainly how they use them for their own uh, benefit. So glad to be here with you, at least virtually, and of course, very sorry not to be with you in Amsterdam. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, hello everyone. Thank you for having us. My name is Hendrik Michael, as Martin already said. I'm a researcher at the University of Bamberg in Germany, and that's where we founded the Scandology Research Initiative. So we've been basically researching the connections between scandals, media, and society for almost seven years now. And it's been a fruitful endeavor with uh, several conferences and books published, a special issue coming up. And um, apart from that, I'm actually a researcher mostly focusing on journalism studies and narrative journalism. So. Um, Maybe some of you can already see how that relates to the study of scandals, which obviously is a very particular form of media narrative. And yeah, uh, to you, André. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for the invitation. I'm happy to be here virtually. Of course, uh, it would have been much more fun to be in Amsterdam. I've never been there, <laughs> to be honest. My name is André. I'm a professor at uh, University of Applied Sciences Kufstein in Tyrol in Austria. Um, before I worked at the University of Bamberg, where I met Hendrik uh, at the same institute we worked in, and uh, yeah, we founded the initiative. My research focus is on strategic and political communication, as well as uh, scandal and crisis communication. And I'm looking forward to our discussion, also the contributions of you, the audience. Yes. Thank you very much. So how, how this works is that I'll be asking you a couple of questions and then we open the floor to everyone in the audience to engage and contribute to the discussion. Uh, I guess I'll start with the obvious, why study scandals in the first place? What makes them important? What makes them interesting? What got you into this subject? Right. Um... Let me just start um, by taking up this question, um, as I already, because it relates to what I already said. Um, I think scandals are, in a way, a magnifying lens uh, through which you can focus on transformations in media, politics, and culture. And I think that's possible because scandals follow like these um, very common patterns, you know, they have recurring faces in communication like first you have the transgression and the concealment then you have the public disclosure then you have the allegations and public disapproval specific agents that are um the scandalizer the scandalized you know, the journalistic media usually and the political agent and um scandals usually spill over in the political system so it's a good way to also look 
through scandals at um, transformations of political culture, for instance. Yeah, yeah I don't know. I'm yeah. Yeah, and uh, I would like to add that um, Hendrik said it's it's like that uh, scandals are magnifying lenses in a way that we can see transformations not only in political culture but, but also in other social fields, for example, um, also the celebrity culture, um, also uh, religion, and so on and so forth. So for example, it's that's the most common example. Um, the the yeah. Some some things uh, Donald Trump said were not being able were not be able would have, would not have been able in the 1970s or 80s in the U.S. For example, yeah, would have been uh, inappropriate. So uh, scandals also tell us a lot about uh, transformations in the culture and the in the whole society of of different nations. Of course. Mm -hmm. And how would you define a scandal? Do you have an exact definition? Because it's a bit of a nebulous word. I think you know, one people. One person might perceive a scandal where the other does not. Yeah, um, there's a common uh, definition. First, you have a transgression of uh, legal norms, for example, or also uh, values. You don't have to break the law, law to to act scandalous. Uh, for example, uh, in in many many cases of so-called uh, talk scandals, um, where politicians, for example, say something inappropriate which is not illegal but might be uh, scandalized. That's the first step. Um, in the second step, the transgressions become public or are live in public, for example, in an, in an interview situation. Yeah. So um, at that point, we see how important the role of mass media and also online media um, is. And in the third step, uh, you you said you said it, Martin. Um, the public or parts of the public. Um, must produce outrage. And that's the most um, difficult point because many, many so-called scandals are not scandals in a, in, a, in a common way. For example, if you look at the Twitter tre trends, just uh, just open the Twitter app and you can see many, many scandals every day where um, small publics are complaining about possible transgressions, um, whereas other publics would say, this isn't the problem. So I think uh, the, rise, the rise of, of social media also changed the way we perceive scandals or scandalous situations, so to say. Right. Yep. So I guess in that regard, scandals are a bit like character attacks in the sense that if you don't get an audience response, then you don't have a scandal or you, you have a failed attack. Yeah, and that's where it overlaps, you know, our two fields, the scandal research or scandology and character assassination. I mean, we see many, you know, scandals thrive on character assassination and um, the idea that, you know, you you try to uh, make something stick with somebody uh, who is scandalized because scandals also of mirror political conflicts where one party tries to scandalize the other. But in general, what Andre said um, and relates well to your question, Martin, it is hard to define scandal nowadays because um, the idea of you know public outrage has been so has become so fuzzy because there are so many you know fragmented online publics. And um, I would say there are on the one hand, it seems like there is a new scandal every day, at least one. And well, on the other hand, I would say that there are almost no real scandals anymore because you don't have this overarching um, um, phenomenon of public outrage or you don't have it in many cases anymore, right? Uh, so it's um, it also relates to this observation that, you know, scandals mirror transformations in society, culture, politics, you know, and are also fueled by technological changes, of course. Yeah. So it, it seems to me like trying to use scandal as a weapon, you know, to harm someone is like playing with fire because it's something that you can never keep under control. You don't know how the scandal is going to work out, who is going to be damaged in the process. It might backfire. What do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, if you look at the political system, it also depends on the type of political character or the type of party. And maybe Mariana could add something to, to my thesis. Um, the thesis is that uh, populist actors 
are less vulnerable uh, concerning character attacks or, or scandals because um, it's a main strategy of po populist politicians and parties to uh, even scandalize themselves to uh, create conflicts on, on different subjects to um, to, to raise a, a public conflict, a, a journalistic conflict, for example, on, on migration, on immigration. But maybe, Mariana, you, you might like to add something from your expertise. Yes. Uh, so the use, the way in which populist politicians use uh, scandals, we basically argue also within our um, celebrity populism initiative that it is really um, uh, a special um, a special line of research. Why? Because populist communication is more emotional eliciting and much more performative in general than non-populist communication. So scandals, which are based mainly on emotions and challenging norms, which is very often the goal of populist communication to provoke the norms, um, is especially interesting, uh, and mainly, uh, not exclusively, within the segment of self-scandalization. So basically, if we can somehow structure it, then it would be, uh, we could say that populists use um, scandals uh, in three ways. First, basically within the anti-establishment discourse, meaning that they use scandals to attack mainstream politicians for their scandals, right? The second line is basically to talk about scandals of populist politicians, uh, and they tend to be um, they they tend to be scandal rich. Think only of the of the late uh, Silvio Berlusconi, of course Donald Trump, and and many many others. And finally, which seems to be discursively or narratively most interesting, is how basically uh, populist politicians um, use self scandalization. Um, um, to, uh, um, uh, to, um, um, uh, to use self-scandalization techniques to attract attention um, because self-scandalization is based on uh, performance, as I said, and challenging different norms. And this aligns perfectly with attention-driven media logic. So what they do, they use scandals to challenge the norms, very often to challenge the norms of political correctness, correctness, so to push themselves to the spotlights and divert attention from substantive political issues. So think about uh, Donald Trump's language, for instance, which is scandalous in so many ways, just the language, let alone actions, or think of some of the strategic, um, even um, strategic uh, communication, even the uh, paid strategic communication, even the advertisements that populists are producing and, and, and sharing uh, during election campaigns. For instance, uh, when Donald Trump uh, did a video um, in which he himself is featured as Thanos, villain from the Avengers and saying in 2020, I'm the inevitable. In, and in this video, he kills, basically destroys all of his opponents. So that's the, the, the paid for communication by populists. Or when Donald Trump made a video in which he was hitting a CNN journalist. So uh, of course, this is a, almost a preposterous behavior of a politician. Very scandalous, of course, but he did that to not only to challenge the norms, but as uh, Hendrik rightly said, to address a certain fragment of the public, which will be delighted by this scandalous be behavior and not outraged. So this is what, how populists very efficiently use scandals to address their audience and their voters. Yeah. All of that sounds regrettably familiar from a Dutch political context as well. Yeah. So uh, your latest conference was on uh, political scandals in the age of populism, partisanship and polarization. Uh, would you say these were some of the key takeaways from that conference? Or is there anything you'd like to add about the results of that interesting discussion? 
Well, what, what I think um, uh, we can take away from our last conference and it uh, relates to what Mariana said is this question how um, on the one hand, you know, uh, populism and polarization are results, you know, from dysfunctions in liberal societies, but um, how they are also a catalyst, you know, for the crisis of democracy and how scandals play into that. You know, polarization is a great example with um, in regard to uh, what Mariana uh, elaborated on in the often used case of Trump, you know, or um, generally looking at American politics. You know. Those self scandalizations work because they cater to a specific target audience, one might say, with their own set of uh, ideology, values, norms, you know, cultural expectations and so on. Um, while outraging the other side. And that's what feeds so well on this whole dynamic of public discourse, you know, because if you have a highly polarized opinion climate, you don't have these overarching scandals where everybody is outraged, but you can use scandals strategically as an instrument for, you know, managing attention, as Mariana rightly said. And, um, you know, profiling your political brand and um, also uh, creating strong identification through that. So yeah, that is a, a takeaway how scandals function in our contemporary climate of polarization, populism, um, partisanship, and how, you know, it is um, also a, a counterpoint to this idea, especially by German sociologists, um, that scandals are functional, that scan scandals have like a cleansing effect in societies. And I would be careful to, to put that label on to contemporary phenomena. Yeah. So one big theme at our conference has been and is illiberalism. And it seems that in illiberal regimes, the political leaders often try to control the media to a large extent and make sure that media that are critical of their regimes um, do not have a lot to say. How do you think illiberal political environments affect scandalization processes where there is, to a more or less degree, there is this controlled media environment? Yeah, I think it was uh, Karl Otto Hondrich, a German sociologist, who uh, wrote that um, scandals in illiberal regimes or authoritarian regimes um, have the role as uh, show trials. For example, if you look to, to China, if you look to, to Russia, where um, politicians, um, the, the ruling party are sometimes uh, put into jail. Um, we don't know if they um, evaded taxes or, or, or not, but often these cases are show trials to uh, strengthen, strengthen the regime of course, the, the media plays an important role. As you said, Martin, uh, most media is, is uh, strongly controlled in, in these countries. Um, also, we have a more or less controlled social media system. But sometimes, uh, as we saw in, uh, in the case of Navalny and the, the video um, about Putin's palace, uh, sometimes social media is um, quite uh, good functioning. Uh, um, for protesters, for activists. So th this video, for example, spilled over to, to Germany, to Europe, also in the US. So um, social media can also contribute uh, partly uh, for the opposition in liberal regimes. And one, one point is also that in liberal uh, systems, we, um, of course, some, some scandals are quite obvious. For example, tax evasion with lots of evidence and so on. But it is allowed to uh, present different narratives. For example, we had um, many, many cases of plagiarism in German politics. And the most famous case was the former Minister of Defense, uh, Gutenberg, and uh, many, many bystanders um, presented the narrative like, oh, um, this is not so, so, um, so bad because I also uh, cheated in school when I was seven or something like this. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is not possible or not possible in that way in illiberal regimes. There is one narrative about one specific case controlled by the elites. Right. Maybe maybe um, two points to add to that, um, if I may. Um, 
because it shows again this nice connection between scandals and uh, um, character assassination if we look at, 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 at liberal regimes, right? Because um, as Andre rightly said, um, character attacks like, you know, the, the, this guy is a, is uh, ev evaded taxes or, or or worse you know they are used to uh, to to um ex post um uh, ruin the name of somebody who is maybe a dissident or an enemy of the regime and so the scandalization technique is nothing where something comes to light and then the, there or some the, there's a public uh, disclosure and then there's public outrage but it's something that comes afterwards to you know basically justify that somebody you know was was put in jail you know so the there is this highly strategic instrumentalized idea about scandal in liberal regimes and the second point is that there are also other types of scandals in free media systems that don't happen, and namely those are scandals like the Panama Papers or or investigative uh, investigative exposés that lead to to large scandals. And obviously, investigative uh, investigative exposés um, thrive in a free press and in investigative journalism. And obviously, that's not possible either if the media system is regulated. Now, on the other hand. You know, maybe scandals like the Navalny case with Putin's palace are an example where it's interesting to look at globalized publics in the context of liberal regimes because it's always this, you know, kind of um, closed up national public, but then always in relation to what is happening in Germany or the United States and how, you know, scandals are reported there and then fed back in their own media system, because obviously you can't shut yourself completely off. And that is interesting how that, for instance, worked in the Navalny case, which was highly reported last spring in German media, for instance, and where Russian media at least had to react to that in some way um, to diffuse the accusations or say well that was already known or um you know play it down basically so there's this interesting dynamic going on there also it's between you know those illiberal regimes and their publics and you know what's happening in the world and global publics because it's obviously interconnected nowadays yes. yeah i'd like if i can if i may uh just uh, also um um add um or um introduce uh a, the European, uh, another example, which is maybe not so much in the spotlight, but still very present uh, in the media, and that's the case of uh, Serbia and uh, Aleksandar Vucic. In, um, in Serbia, much of the media uh, has been controlled by the government, especially by the president, Aleksandar Vucic. And uh, recently, in the last couple of months, um, you've probably um, been at least at least heard of a uh, huge protests uh, because of of a uh, of a tragic shooting that happened in one of the schools in Serbia and Serbia is uh, next to uh, the United States one of the countries which has the most um privately owned uh, ammunition and guns uh so this tragic um situation happened in which um a child went to school and uh shot uh his fellow um uh, students basically friends and teachers and uh, this provoked uh, of course huge reaction and outrage of the publics in Serbia which started walking uh, against the violence each weekend uh, and this is basically also a walk against the government and, uh, and uh, the regime of Aleksandr Vucic and it has been very interesting uh, how um, Aleksandr Vucic has been using his media uh, especially his tabloid uh, media, and I say his because they are they are basically um, almost edited by Alexander Vucic, and you can see that on every page, cover page, um, to um, attack uh, his um, basically the people who are walking um, by using the scandals. So uh, interesting fact, another interesting fact is that the faces of these walks and these protests um, um, are the actors. So the actors have become informal um, um, leaders of these protests in the last couple of weeks. 
So Alexander Vucic uh, has been using his media to attack these people, mostly based on scandals. So, and they are celebrities, so it, it makes it even, even easier to attack them based on scandals because celebrity culture is, is so very much connected to the, um, to the scandalous discourse, right? So it, it's very interesting uh, how many headlines you had in the newspapers, like scandalous, outrageous, this person is walking against violence, for instance, a certain actor, and he himself was accused of attacking another person or something like that. So he has, it's very, uh, it's very symptomatic how the regime of Alexander Vucic has been using scandals and this discourse of scandals to um, to um, to deal, so to speak, with the leaders of the recent process. And again, very much shows this close connection between scandals and character assassination. Yes, thank you. I think it's time to open the floor to others as well. We have two assistants helping us out. Hello. Um, so uh, my name is Rupert Younger from the University of Oxford. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you and the organisers for uh, introducing me to some wonderfully named groups, because I live in a world of rather boringly named groups. Uh, and, and I go to conferences like the, the Moral Values Paradigm and things like that. And now I've been introduced to the Character Assassination Programme and now the Scandology Roundtable. So I'm very grateful for being introduced to this, this bonkers group of people. Um, my question is a definitional one, and, and I've got a comment and then a question, if I may. So for Mariana, uh, very interesting, your comments on political scandals and this idea that politicians use scandals strategically to build their own profile. Um, I wonder if there's perhaps not a difference in what you're saying between scandals and welcoming scandals and being a disruptor. So we've talked about this idea in the UK a lot about Boris Johnson and others being disruptors. And that's not scandalizing or indeed welcoming scandal. That's that's about being seen as an outsider. And I think Donald Trump was the same. He wanted to, to, uh, to, to um, clean the swamp and all of those type of languages were really around disruption. I think there may be a difference between what you're talking about as welcoming scandal and positioning yourself as a disruptor. So that's the first comment. But my main question, I guess, to all of you is, um, is there a difference between scandal and crisis? Mm -hmm. Andre, maybe that's yeah. a question for you. <laughs> okay, um, coming to the first uh, comment or question, um, the, the thing, uh, the definite uh, difference between uh, disruption and, and scandalization, um, I'd like to, to show it on, on an example. For instance, in, uh, in Austria, there is the, the Freedom Party, the Austrian Freedom Party, the right-wing populist party, and in the 2010 years, they uh, were often scandalized because of their political campaignings, of their posters, of their uh, slogans on the posters, which were quite um, anti-immigrant and uh, you know, in a way like uh, they were constructed uh, with bad rhymes and so on. And um, these were scandals in the public discourse. So I think it's um, also it also depends on the culture, on the political culture. Um, if uh, Donald Trump says this, this is m probably more, more scandalized in, in Germany or in, in Europe and, and less in the US and the other way around when German politicians say something or do something. Uh, the second question, yeah, we discussed uh, that question um, many times in the last year, I think, also with Timothy Coombs, um, because we have a different uh, view on, on, on than, than him. him. Um, I'd say um, crisis of crisis of politicians uh, scandals of politicians for instance uh, tax evasion or or um or um yeah talk scandals um come first and after that there is a crisis uh, organizational crisis for the party personal crisis for the politician um you could also say um in the way timothy uh, defines it that crisis comes first and then a scansis that's his term um, can be um, the outcome, um, for example, if organizations, companies, parties, and so on, are not managing the, scan uh, the crisis in the right way. He also shows this in the new Scandology book in the collected volume. Um, I think it was on the, the case of um, um, 
yeah, um, there were some cases uh, he presented, um, for example, uh, Disney and the whole uh, the gender debate uh, and so on. So I'd say crisis is an outcome of a scandal. And we see that in many, many ways. And also in history, if you look at, at a big scandals, uh, for instance, the, the donation scandal in Germany, um, which uh, took place in the 1990s, uh, 2000 years, uh, the CDU, the, um, the Conservative Party, struggled there and had to restore the the, the image um, for for some years. Yeah, this this took some time. Yeah, maybe um, two additional points. To one, the idea of the outsider and the way you know um, how scandals are then used. I think um, if you if you uh, frame yourself as an outsider. Um, this whole uh, idea of scandalization comes easier because as an outsider, you sometimes reject or you, you know, disagree with the norms already established by the inside group. And then those norms don't necessarily apply to you. And that makes this whole uh, process of scandalization, um, you know, take on a different dynamic if you pose yourself off a, as an outsider, because again, scandals really rely on the breach of norms, values, you know, that are very important for a specific group of people. But if you say, well, I'm not part of this specific group of people, then, you know, the, the, the application of those trends or, or those transgressions feature different for you. And that's the second part of what I wanted to answer in relation to Andre's uh, elaboration on the relationship between scandals and crises. Um, I think scandals are always a discursive process. I think rarely it's the case that you would say scandals are concrete phenomenon, something that is essentially there. I think scandals are highly constructivist and work through, you know, discursive practices in the process where specific or, you know, agents um, try to um, feed into this process. You know, the scandalizers, the scandalized for us. Crisis maybe has more of an essential quality, concrete phenomena that are crises, you know, that society, societies need to react on. But apart from that, I agree with Andre's elaboration that scandals can lead to crises as well, you know, because you figure that your whole, you know, political system is on very shaky grounds, for instance, after um, several scandals have been, you know, um, uh, the political system has been hit by several scandals, you know, and then you have a crisis of the political system, but that's something very substantial. But scandals, in a way, are sometimes very ephemeral, if that's the right word, so a bit, you know, lofty and fuzzy and, um, you know, hard to pin down while the scandal is unfolding. Okay, thank you. There yeah, was another I, question. Sorry, you... can I just, Martin, can I just um, answer also the question about disruption and scandals very quickly? Yep. And thank you for the question, because I think it's a, it's a great one. Uh, very quickly, um, I think we can look at it as disruption being the end goal um, of the entire uh, self-scandalization strategy. And self-scandalization or scandalization is a strategy or basically a discourse. We can think about it as a discourse. And back to you, um, you can also ask why media creates scandals. So uh, not necessarily is the disruption the end goal, but uh, they create discourse of scandals because of a, uh, attention economy and also profit, so gain. So I think we can think about these two concepts as disruption being the end goal of the scandalization strategy. Thank you. Hi, I'm Esther Kirsch from the Corvinus University of Budapest. Uh, thank you for this fascinating um, discussion. I find your project very important. And um, my question is, would be posed in the context of illiberal regimes like my country, Hungary, and um, with regard to issues where there should be a scandal, but there's none because of the lack of outrage in society. I give you an obvious example, corruption. Um, in countries like mine, corruption is like an accepted form of doing politics, unfortunately, seen by the society. So my, my question would be uh, whether in your project you look into uh, the question of what are the efficient tools of the media 
and civil society to address that lack of outrage and to uh, increase awareness of the society with regard to issues like corruption, where objectively speaking, there should be outrage and there should be a scandal. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this um, great question because it's some it relates to this general idea, um, and that's always the puzzling thing. Why are certain things, certain transgressions, becoming scandals in some places, but are not scandalized elsewhere? You know, and um, I think corruption is a very, very tricky case because. Um, it's it's um it depends um on the you know significance and how prevalent it is if it if corruption is very prevalent in the political system and it's some something that occurs on an everyday basis um it it is also somewhat part of this political culture and it's taken for granted through the public of a specific you know, political system or attached to a specific political system. And once that's taken for granted and um, it's hard to scandalize it, it's hard to scandalize it unless, you know, you scandalize the, so to speak, tip of the iceberg cases, you know, but it's also hard to get from there to, you know, a reformation of the whole system in particular with, you know, those whole financial scandals, corruption, tax evasion, you know, um, they are hard to scandalize in the broader public. They're not that hard to scandalize if there is a legal issue involved. So if this is something that has been or that can be determined through the legal system and where the courts would rule, well, this is a crime and you go to prison, then it's easier to scandalize that. I mean, there were several cases, Andre, in, in Germany with you know, uh, during the pandemic, the masks and how uh, people put money in their own pockets, so to speak, by um, making mass deals. And that was a scandal in a way, but it was only a scandal so far that it was, you know, um, discursively mediated in the legal system, whereas the public, you know, they were like, um, not, I mean, there, there was not that, that much outrage. Or Andre, would you disagree? Um, partly. <laughs> um, coming to your first uh, uh, thesis that um, tax evasion, for example, is uh, sometimes hard to um, to scandalize. That's true. Um, if we look at the Panama Papers, that's a, that's a very interesting case. In Germany, um, some newspapers were the leading investigators on the, the, the whole thing. For example, Süddeutsche Zeitung. And what we witnessed, um, what we saw is that especially the, the contributing newspapers or news houses um, were uh, reporting extensively on that case and for a long period. For example, Süddeutsche Zeitung, I think one or two years, um, and, and they covered the, the whole Panama Papers affair. Um, <clears throat> but from my point of view, and that, but I don't have data, um, the broader public um, it wasn't so outrageous maybe in the first two, three days or the first week. But afterwards, um, I, hear no, I hear nobody talking about the Panama Papers anymore. But um, it is a huge, a huge scandal because it's a huge amount of money, powerful institutions and persons involved. So this is kind of um, strange, I think, yeah. And the second thing, um, what Hendrik um, explained, mask, mask deals, we call them mask deals because some politicians, um, promoted um, manufacturers for, for masks, um, organized uh, the whole um, process of, of, uh, yeah, of supply chain and so on. Um, I'm not sure, but not many cases, uh, not many cases were uh, illegal. So here we have this uh, thing that some, something happened and it's unethical because a politician of the German parliament uh, got, for example, one or two million euros just um, <clears throat> um, just for managing or 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 saying to the ministry, hey, I've got a manufacturer here. Buy buy at them, but uh, buy them buy their masks. So um, this wasn't a um, completely a legal dispute. This was a moral scandal, so to say. Yeah. And there's also the issue of normalization, 
And um, as you, as as uh, the colleague uh, emphasized, that corruption has been almost right normalized in the in the public in the discourse of uh, Hungary, not only Hungary, also other countries. That's one thing. And the other thing is that scandals also uh, and, and the fact, not the fact, but the assumption, and that's mainly and that's also a populist assumptions in many countries that politicians are corrupt, has been like business as usual. It has been so normalized that scandals that basically reveal this specific situations have been also normalized. And that's, I think, the um, that's the that, that's of course a problem or uh, normalization of uh, unethical behavior uh, or also outrageous language that has been happening in, in many countries um, uh, represents a danger to democratic standards. Thank you. So he hello, um, Alexander Evans, London School of Economics. Um, thanks so very much for what's been a really fascinating roundtable so far. I, I want to pick up and really continue on this corruption theme, because it seems we talked about sort of, if you like, some of the personal scandals linked to celebrity culture. Um, we've talked about the fact that, you know, there, there's perhaps this renormalization of corruption. I just wonder what the panel's view was. There, there's an academic literature on neo-patrimonialism, arguing at what we're seeing in a wider sense is the renormalization of patrimonialism in politics, in democratic politics. So question one is to what extent is, is that a, a macro trend that is shaping the context of, of scandals? Question two, if I may, it's long been an assumption that, that one of the antidotes to this in policy terms is accountability, is transparency and accountability. But if in essence, the response to that transparency and accountability is, is doesn't have the same uh, salience, it doesn't have the same strength that it had before. Um, are we are we sort of facing a double wave, a wave of neo-patrimonialism, but also kind of a weakening of one of the key tools that we might use to combat that and, and corruption and scandals, which is transparency? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for this great question. Um, I think um, it, it uh, my answer would be, um, kind of uh, elaborating on the point I already made, um, because this concept of patrimonialism seems to me to relate to the interconnection, for instance, between the political system and the legal system as well. You know, um, the United States are a good example, I think, right at the moment where, you know, Supreme Court justices are assigned lifetime seats. And then, you know, it comes to light that they are uh, obviously, um, you know, entwined with uh, more entwined with the political system than you would assume, and they also take, um, you know, money and trips and vacations and so on and so forth. So this is a trend we can see, and this is a trend obviously that is has been going on for um, not that long, in my opinion. But um, uh, maybe I'm just sent because I'm. I haven't paid attention to that when I was maybe in my early 20s, and now I pay attention to it more. But it seems to be a fairly new phenomenon. And obviously, then it's uh, hard to evaluate this phenomenon. But it seems to be that once you know that you have these macro trends going on, um, uh, uh, scandalization also uh, loses its, its edge, so to speak. So we have, again, this idea of the cultural setting political culture, legal culture that is affecting the way how, you know, certain, certain things can be brought to light, can be scandalized, can be disappropriated publicly, and then maybe changed or reformed. And in the other, uh, on the other hand, there's an interesting case um, of scandalization of a German, a young German politician, Philipp Amthor. He um, was uh, it, or it came to light that he tried to, you know, um, uh, um, uh, help uh, uh, um, an investment company, a New York investment company, to get um, money from the German government, simply speaking, you know, to, to, to make deals, you know, and use his connections to open doors for this investment company. And that was, has been brought, uh, been brought to light. And Philip Amthor just said, pretty much um, shortly after this came to light. Yes, it's true. Yes, this was stupid. And yes, I will um, cut all deals with this company, you know, and then later in court, it was determined that nothing was legally wrong with it. So he was off, off the hook, basically speaking. So this 
strategy of taking accountability, making things transparent, even though in 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 hindsight, you know, can be a good way to avert a political crisis for for the individual. On the other hand, on the larger level, this question of accountability and transparency is a, a bit complicated because it also has to do with um, the lack of trust in institutions nowadays, uh, a lack of trust in institutions that, on the other hand, has been perpetuated, for instance, by independent media and investigative journalism who, for instance, uncovered the Pentagon Papers and Watergate and so on and so forth in the 70s, and that this might be ripple effects of these, yeah, basically cornerstones of free democratic societies and free media that is still affecting how the public sees, you know, political institutions, legal institutions today. So it's kind of a paradox on the more, you know, we report on it, the that is obviously affecting trust and that is affecting the ways that, you know, political and legal institutions and so on can claim accountability and can, you know, make use of uh, uh, averting crisis by being more transparent because the public says, well, you know, we know that you're um, not to be trusted anyways. So yeah. it's, it's paradox yeah. and it's Thank you. Sorry to cut you short, but uh, we're running short on time and there's room for one or two more questions, depending on how long the answer is going to be. There's one in the chat. Can countering a scandal or crisis be a political branding opportunity among illiberal candidates, i.e. Trump's infamous TMZ video, or is there a limit to how much scandals can help or dismantle political candidates? And try to keep it brief. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I think it might be a, might be a provocative stance, but I think not that they uh, might contribute to political branding, but they usually do. That's my position, because uh, um, yeah, think of uh, Donald Trump and how much and probably he's going to benefit uh, from the accusations about um, all his uh, embezzlements. So that's one example, right? So I most of the time uh, they actually do profit when you when we talk about populist candidates or illiberal candidates not the same populist and illiberal but both may benefit from scandals and that are basically um targeting them i'm sylvia from charles university uh and my question would be maybe to end in a positive way when can scandal be positive not for a politician for a his own promotion but maybe when can scandal lead to something positive in society or in politics yeah mm. I'd say um, the functionalist idea of scandal reporting isn't that. So um, looking at hard scandals like corruption, um, child abuse in, in the Catholic Church, for example, and so on and so forth, these cases were driven by journalism, uh, also by investigative journalism. So I think um, we can be happy that um, we read in, we read about scandals in the newspapers, um, on, uh, see see them on te on television because there are, there are only two options. If there is no scandal reporting anymore, everyone is behaving well, yeah, or something is wrong with the free media. So these are the two options. So I think um, I have a, a huge trust trust in quality journalism and also investigative journalism. I think uh, that's the positive point we uh, could dig out of the whole uh, scandal communication process. Okay, thanks very much. Then please join me in thanking our free speakers.